Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters. And if you are watching this today when we are recording it on February 22nd, just a reminder, it will be rebroadcast on the radio um, later this week. Welcoming to the show, Emily Kornheiser, one of the representatives from Brattleboro. How are you, Emily? I am doing well. Good to see you, Olga. Good to see you, too. And Meg, Constitution Wrangler and (laughs) former professor at Marlboro College. So glad you can join us today, Meg. It's always fun to talk to both of you. I look forward to these invitations. Thank you so much. Well, one thing we want to talk about today is civil debate. And we're finding ourselves at this interesting little pause in, in Vermont's timetable, we have passed the national election and things have sort of settled down. The legislature has started, um, the pandemic is moving forward. And then next week is uh, town meeting day in Vermont, which is um, the day most towns in non COVID times uh, get together and uh, vote on the budget, vote on a number of issues facing the town. And so in this, this kind of lull and reevaluation, we wanted to revisit the issue of civic debate and this concept of communities coming together to talk about the issues that face them. And in town meeting, it's a very formalized relationship where the, the townspeople are the legislature, but we have a lot of community conversations, not just formalized municipal ones. And so we want to talk about that and civil debate. Um, Emily, for you, just before I go to Meg, I'd love to hear from you about what you are seeing as a lawmaker, either in the in the house as they try to have all these conversations over Zoom during the pandemic, or from the community. You know, who's who's at the table? Who's being left out? how is this process serving democracy, revitalizing democracy, or not? Ooh, big questions. Um, we go big or go home. <laughs> I think on the community level, we have different people having the conversations than might have before the pandemic. So um, I'm seeing a lot more parents able, parents of young children able to participate on sort of a Sunday morning, you know constituent conversation because they can tune in from home and just, you know, turn the video on and off depending on what's happening in the background. Um, I've heard from a lot of folks with various um, mobility issues or um, physical issues like that who really appreciate being able to zoom in from home. I know some folks with chronic illness who feel like the pandemic in some ways has brought the whole world to where they wanted them to be 10 years ago. So that's really incredible in terms of participation. And then there's the fact that everything we do is broadcast in the, everything we do in the legislature is now broadcast on YouTube. And so I'm getting feedback one, and we've said this before on the show, I'm getting feedback from different constituents than I have in the past who are watching that on YouTube. I've seen that BCTV has started sometimes broadcasting the legislative committee hearings on BCTV. So that's a whole new audience for our work And then um, different people can come testify than might've felt comfortable testifying in the past. I had a public hearing for the public workshop for the government accountability committee on Saturday. And because of zoom one, I was able to do legislative work on a Saturday that in other times would be really disruptive to my family for me to not be home for those sort of core three days that I have off, um, off being said very yes. sort of sarcastically during the week. And then um, we were able to have communities of color from throughout the state attend this without having to drive all the way to Montpelier. So that's all really huge for access and debate and participation. Um, I'm giving a very long winded answer. answer. Simultaneously, there is um, nastiness on social media, which is nastier, um, which often actually I find myself thinking longer and harder about what I'm going to say on social media sometimes 
um, because I don't have the time to deal with the fallout. It's not even that I don't have the, you know, vim and vigor to deal with the fallout because, well, I actually really like arguing with people. It's more <laughs> that <laughs> um, I really don't have the time. So often I'll see misinformation on, um, say, the Brattleboro, Vermont Facebook page or um, some other conversation happening, wanting to pipe in and really just like add some information about process or available services or whatever it is. But I know that people are going to say things back to me that I don't have the time to be participating in. And so I'm actually seeing myself like silencing myself a little bit because of the tenor of debate and how much time I know I'll need to give to that type of debate to keep it um, to keep it in a place that I feel comfortable with. Mm. The other piece, the last piece that I'll say is um, the Vermont legislature really prides itself on um, how mostly nonpartisan it is. Um, there's a big culture that I was very explicitly indoctrinated into when I started about how, um, how polite we are to each other, how civil debate is how much we have friends across the aisle and how often bills come out of committee unanimously. There are absolutely problems with how that level of civility leads to people not asking questions they might wanna ask um, and how that sort of story really damps down, um, I think class differences and racial, all kinds of things. But it is a strong part of the culture in Montpelier. And this year, um, I'm seeing it shift a little bit as we've had new members join us who ran for office during for the first time during one of the most divisive election cycles in history. And they and they don't have the social context of the state house. And so they are coming in just assuming that things are divisive because that's their experience of politics thus far. And then they're acting on that assumption of divisiveness in a way that actually creates divisiveness. Um, and so that's really interesting to watch. One very small example of that, and then um, I'm gonna defer to Meg here, is we have this, um, we have a few cultural pieces of our daily life in the state house that, um, you know, pros, cons. We say the Pledge of Allegiance every Tuesday morning. We still do that on Zoom. It's very awkward. Um, everyone's saying it at the same time, unmuted, and it's like not synchronous, and it's an electronic flag, and it's all just very peculiar. But one of the other things we do um, is we have something called devotionals. And historically, that was a minister coming in every single morning to pray with us or for us. And under Gay Symington, who was um, a few speakers ago, that broadened to include non-Christian faith leaders. And then under Speaker Johnson, who was the previous speaker, that really broadened to include musicians and poets. Mm -hmm. um, but the roots of it are still very much sort of in this time of prayer and um, outside of time. Mm -hmm. And while we've been on Zoom, We've, um, we're not having guest people do devotionals. We're just having members do devotionals. Hmm. And some members are using this opportunity to really um, sort of politicize social issues, to walk sort of this, to walk a little bit of a line in speaking to other members. And it's, it gets a little luxury sometimes. Um, and the thing is about being lectured is that it might feel really good when it's like your side lecturing, but it feels really terrible when it's the other side lecturing. And if you open the world up to the lectures, all the lectures will come. <laughs> you will all get lectured from all angles. And so that's just like one of the, it's just like one of the little bits of culture that has been shifting that feels like it's more partisan than we've had in the past for better or for worse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Meg, would you like to jump in there with, with your thoughts? Well, I love hearing Emily's description, precise descriptions of what the culture is in the legislature, because uh, I don't, I haven't been listening to a uh, committee. I didn't realize those were now available um, through BCTV. That's pretty amazing. Um, 
So I have my ideas based on other theorists or other big books that I read. Uh, but then to actually hear what the day-to-day -day, uh, business is like, that's super interesting to me. Uh, and I was, I'm, I think this idea of like, when does civility turn into uniform thought is a big issue that you were talking about, Emily. Um, and so how does one maintain a sense of, yeah, we're all in this together and let's not fool ourselves. We have very different understandings of what government should do. And we may also have very different understandings of what government shouldn't do. So um, I, I'm, you know, that'll be just curious to keep watching to see how uh, the culture starts to allow for actual debate about fundamental issues and doesn't get turned into lecturing as if one side has all the right answers and the other side doesn't. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I have just sort of a couple of thoughts that I've been wrestling with in my head and, and, and I'm not sure they, they pertain to, to Vermont as much as sometimes I think they do. So this would be sort of like interesting for me. Um, so one of the ways that uh, people who study deliberative democracy or um, democratic theory is uh, to distinguish between the difference of looking forward together, what should we do to, uh, which is a very different type of discourse than looking back on what has happened to me. And, and that's a place where, not to say that the past isn't very important and people's experience aren't, aren't very important, um, but that can easily turn into more of a lecture than actually solving a problem, what can we do together? Um, so that's, that's just something I've observed is that I'm always wanting groups who are trying to reach a decision to first of all say, okay, what do we need to do to not be on the same page? Cause that's always a recipe for disaster. Uh, you know, why do we have a constitution? Cause there's very few things that we actually agree on. And most of those have to do with procedure and limits on government. But some of these broader <laughs> concerns, you know, I don't think we have unanimity and, sh and we shouldn't. I mean, this is a system of government that's set up for people to keep arguing until something gets resolved and then they'll argue about it a year later. But um, so I, I, do, I do worry when people just say, well, we should get all on the same page. But then how do you deal with issues when there's uh, certain harms that have happened in the past and Vermont wants to do that kind of work and not lose people because you don't want the you don't want to drain out the who's the we and what should we do. Uh, so I, I mean that to me seems like the uh, the biggest difficulty at the moment. Just looking uh, at how do you how do towns because towns are facing this right now, not just Montpelier. How do towns build a we that recognizes people may have had different experiences in the past. I don't know. I'm really um, interested in helping people come to agreement on sort of the ends that they're interested in, the, the aspirational endpoint, and recognizing that we don't actually have to agree on the means most of the time. There's usually space for multiple strategies to get towards that end. Um, but that's really, I think the there's some level of live and let live to that, that I think is really hard. And I think particularly culturally difficult in New England, especially in the Valley towns um, to really say that we don't have to, we don't have to agree on the past. We don't have to agree on how we're gonna get to the future. We just have to agree that it's okay for you, that your version of getting to the future and my version of getting to the future won't cancel each other out. Yeah, interesting. Right. Exactly. I mean, there's such fabulous uh, examples of groups that you never think would have anything in common. So uh, the Koch brothers have a think tank and they were pairing with the ACLU on ending the drug war. And it's like, okay, they had very different ideas on their analysis of the drug war, mm -hmm. but they shared a commitment to dialing it way back. Uh, and, and you know, th those are the sort of coalitions that can get built if, as you say, Emily, people are not overly prescriptive about the road to what you're trying to get to. So 
okay, devil's advocate. You know, one thing I'm hearing in a lot of community conversations is that people are coming from a place of feeling harmed or let down or excluded from the system, whether that's a community or the legislature or what have you. And so there's been a loss of trust. Mm -hmm. And so how do we um, support each other or communicate with each other so that we can rebuild that trust so folks are even willing to, to move forward with, with a process or to trust a process or to trust that those outcomes will even happen? Yeah. Well, I think a good apology or a good reparative process um, really just starts with history. And that's a very small part of it. It's really, um, it's mostly spent, and certainly, you know, if I'm in a, an argument in my own family, we spend lots of time wallowing in the history and the intention and the misunderstanding. But that's not really best practice for repair and restore. What is, what's best is that you're really like, it's the impact is what you're apologizing for. And then it's what's gonna come next. It's how you're actually going to change towards the future, that is where the most of the healing happens. It's an acknowledgement, but it's also what are we gonna do next? So I think government can do quite a lot by saying we're going to do better and this is what better will look like. And in order to rebuild trust, for me, that's sort of the core of what rebuilding trust in government looks like. It's not about, um, it's acknowledging, but it's not, um, it's not doing the work of historians. That's what historians are for. Thank you, Emily. How about you, Meg? Yeah, uh, I wonder if like to try this through the question of policing, say that that's an, uh, a place where uh, can there be built trust around re police reform? Because it's not as if we need trust in police to start with, if I'm, you know, the problem is if we reform the police, is are the reforms gonna be done in such a democratic way that everybody in the community feels like they participated. Um, if it gets turned into, uh, you know, this is where Emily, probably I would even stay away from any word like reparative or restorative at this point, uh, cause that's assuming that there was a specific harm, but just to say, okay, do we think that we as a community can change uh, policing so that we all feel better about it. And um, that's gonna be a very hard one because right now that's a such a divisive issue that, um, I, I mean, the hope is that people start thinking about practical solutions and look at very practical solutions that have come up either at like the 21st century uh, task force on policing that the Obama administration started. They had police involved, they had community leaders involved, uh, they had law professors involved, and they came up with these really specific ideas. Okay, this is what we need to do. And uh, then a new administration, it gets put aside and everybody loses trust in uh, the ability of Americans to make reforms because nobody's trusting each other. I, I still think policing could be a good way to go forward, like just to start with what do people want of the police? What do the police want of the community? Uh, and uh, oftentimes it'll turn into racial concerns. Sure, there's room for that, but I think class is enormous here because uh, policing was a job you didn't need a liberal arts degree for. Be nice if they paid a little more. And so um, I, I think that's, that's a place where if, if we, look, we get to, what is the future, what would it look like in Brattleboro say, if we had the sort of policing that we felt good about and that we had um, enough conversations about policing on a regular basis that people feel like they could actually join as opposed to feeling like they had to take a side and use the language that each side is demanding people use. So I, I know that's a place where it, people should be allowed to say really stupid things in their ideas about how to change policing. And the moderator needs to say, okay, that's a really interesting idea. Let's put this down too. And then let's hear from some others. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that gets at some of these issues. 
What I find really difficult in those really exploratory conversations, which I think are so important, and the conversations that give space for people to say what they actually think about things um, in order to make plans for the future, is that they often, I think part of the reason people default to um, talking points is because we're having the conversation fresh over and over and over again, because we haven't set the container mm. um, for folks mm. to be the same people to be having the conversation with each other yes. in an iterative way. Mm. And the container of town meetings sometimes feels like a possibility for that. Um, but once a year is not often enough to be talking about anything that is meaningful. Yeah, yeah I so agree. This is where I'd love to see it in the schools. Like, uh, why isn't civics part of the curriculum? And civics would then be, okay, high school students, let's do a civics project. Uh, here is a problem. How to balance uh, equality, safety, uh, protecting people and also protecting rights. So go off into the community, see what the different arguments are. Go see what the different arguments are that are happening around the country. Now let's have a forum. And uh, not as a, uh, a debate where one side wins and the other loses, but very specific about how are these arguments made? What is the evidence that they're relying on? Uh, and so that people start to build these deliberative habits of thinking logically, speaking persuasively, which brings in the emotion and experience, and also being able to trust that you can imagine with others a solution. Well, I think what you and Emily are saying, Meg, that is so simple but profound in a way, so often when we, when we even talk about like civil conversations or community conversations, we do call them debates, but how much of our uh, political process, for lack of a better term, is set up around competition? Someone will win, someone will lose, rather than more of what we're talking about, this concept of group problem solving right. yeah. and, and moving forward on an issue, that those two just have such different um, feelings to me and, and are different processes. The idea of trusting in the other people in the room to co-create um, mm -hmm. is really, it's huge and it's incredibly difficult if we spend most of our time in our own microcosms um, and don't have the time and space to step outside of that. And I, are we talking about, can I talk about Robert's rules now or is it too early? Oh no, no go ahead. No. I think um, <laughs> I am, um, I think one of the things that's interesting about Robert's rules of order or any, any formal rules of order, we use um, some other man's names, rules of order in the legislature, I've forgotten his name. Um, and what's interesting about it is it does, it creates a structure that allows for people to depersonalize mm -hmm. the debate, which is incredibly important. Um, you can't think that someone, just because someone disagrees with your legislative idea that they disagree with your soul. And I think that the rules of debate often really very much help us do that. But because they're so formalized in a culture that is so informal at this point, I think a lot of people find that incredibly alienating. Mm. And it seems like an impenetrable system in a world where people feel that many systems are impenetrable to them. Mm. And so I wonder what a, what else is available? Um, how Robert's Rules of Order can feel more human. You know, we have a new clerk of the house. Um, her name's Betsy Ann Rask. She's incredible. And she has a lot of intonation in her voice. And so when she reads something aloud, whether it's a resolution about floor proceedings or whatever it is, she brings a lot of life to it. And it makes a big difference for our ability to comprehend what she's saying. And I think, you know, um, I remember the first time I saw a production of Shakespeare in the park where the actors were really feeling their words. All of a sudden, all of this language that felt totally impenetrable to me all, all of a sudden had meaning. And so I think we need to look for ways to enliven whatever formal system that we're using 
so that people feel like they do have a chance of using it. It's not just a tool of exclusion or manipulation. It's a, it's a tool that's accessible and meet, full of meaning making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, um, I think uh, public debates, public deliberation about key issues, those don't follow Robert's rules. That's much more of, okay, let's tr consider this argument. Let's consider the pros and cons. Now let's find a second argument and let's find a third argument. And as a group, let's consider those and people can weigh in on it. Um, Robert's rules only make sense when you're, when you're have very specific language that's crafted to lead an assembly towards making a decision and that can be amended. So in so, other words, starting with a motion, a crafted exactly. motion and taking yeah. a vote. And, and all the work of a well-run deliberative body is in the preparing of those motions, those articles on our warrants, uh, which is why, you know, it's, it's kind of sad now. Um, and, and I don't want to like blame, but it is true that town meetings have less to argue, to deliberate now, because more and more is being taken off uh, town jurisdiction. So there's a uh, for I'm sure good reason. So I don't, again, I'm not trying to blame Montpelier here, but some uh, like some of the laws around uh, school budgets reduce what schools could actually deliberate. So mm -hmm. there's been a restriction over the years of what towns can actually handle. Uh, but that's just in town meeting with Robert's rules, creating that uh, very formal structure about, and it's all about language, very specific language changes. This other thing uh, is, what communities could be doing all the time. Where, I mean, the problems are, that's a great thing about living in the 21st century. We've got lots of problems and we know what those problems are. And they're thorny problems. They, we don't, there's no quick solution. We can't go back to the past all the time and say, well, this is what we did and so we can just do it again. And I think, well, that's a great time for us to be more imaginative. imaginative. And maybe COVID is allowing, I'm hoping, for people getting together to deliberate about an issue rather than feel like they have to reach a decision that on very formal language and making those kind of changes. So what, I'm I think still, two things. what I'm still seeing though is our select board um, is mm. deliberating and people can witness that deliberation and then they can respond to that deliberation, but the public is not part of the deliberative process as an equal player or in the legislature, um, anyone can now watch our deliberative process and then occasionally we have public hearings or you can be invited to give testimony, but you are not a full player in the deliberation. And so exactly. again, your only option is to respond to the terms of debate that have already been laid out to you by people in power. Mm -hmm. So why does Brattleboro, and I know this is a very contentious issue and I don't want to, it, you know, I'm just sort of throwing it out there. Uh, Brattleboro created this new animal called the representative town meeting. And I think personally it suffers exactly what you're talking about. The representatives deliberate and the public are spectators. And I don't know how to solve this except some, you know, other countries, Switzerland, I guess is uh, really takes deliberation very, very seriously. So even in a large, city, there's going to be neighborhoods that deliberate and then it moves up the ranks. But the fact is of the matter is that people are learning those skills to deliberate, to participate, as opposed to just watching, you know, as you say, uh, elected representatives who have probably some power and not so much power uh, to, to actually do the, to have it itself, the job of deliberation. We Thank have you. Oh, we Sorry, we need to go to break. Do you have a quick a quick point to make, Emily. I was just going to say that Burlington has a neighborhood assembly planning assembly process. Um, and we had someone on a previous show to sort of talk about how that evolved. And we can talk about that more after the break. That would be wonderful. The Montpelier Happy Hour will return on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro right after a word from our underwriters. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you're just joining us, I am speaking with regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser, as well as Meg Mott, our guest. Thanks for joining us, Meg. You're welcome. It's great to be here. 
So town meeting, annual town meeting day in Vermont is right around the corner. And it feels completely different this year because of COVID. And so many towns have either decided to just vote straight everything on an uh, Australian ballot without holding an in-person meeting, while some people have uh, or towns have postponed their meetings until warmer weather with fingers crossed that they will be able to hold an outdoor in-person meeting. And um, one thing that's interesting about Brattleboro is that because we have a representative town meeting structure, we're able, we're the only town in the state that's able to hold our formal proceedings over Zoom. Even Bur I thought Burling Burlington can't. No, they don't have a. They don't have a, a true town. They meeting. don't have the right. same thing. And the reason that we can do that is because we have a discrete list of people, we're able to guarantee that every single one of those people was invited and has an opportunity to deal with the technology. Um, and so right before the break, Meg said something really interesting about how our representative town meeting system in Brattleboro um, leads some people to be making decisions and other people watching from the outside, which I agree with in theory. And then my understanding of the history of us moving to representative town meeting is actually that not enough people were showing up for town meeting. Mm -hmm. And this is like the most New Englandy thing ever. The idea was that if it was a representative town meeting and people were um, elected to hold those spots then people would feel sort of a moral obligation to attend. And we've had a higher attendance since we became a representative body than we did before we were a representative body, which is just layers of fascinating. <laughs> well, what I find interesting about representative town meeting, and um, uh, this is a, a little bit of a curiosity on my part, but perhaps even a little bit of a criticism, I find it interesting in town representative town meeting, I will often hear someone say, well, we've been elected to speak for our districts. Uh, for those who don't know, Brattleboro is divided into three districts um, for, for voting purposes and representing purposes. And that's true. You know, the, the concept is you run and your district elects you to, In to, a non to represent them. Election. They're hardly hmm? ever, then they're hardly ever competitive elections. Exactly. Uh, a lot of write-ins actually afterwards um, for caucusing. But I sometimes feel a little frustrated because it seems to me, I, I wanna say, when I hear someone say that, I ask, well, how do you know? Have you taken a survey? Have you called up your constituents? Have con constituents, district mates, I should probably say. Have they contacted you? Um, and so while I feel representative town meeting is, is doing some, some good things, I wonder when reps say, well, I know this about my district, do they just know their experience, which is fine, but are they really speaking for the whole distance district? Do you kind of see what I'm struggling with here? And I'm sure reps would think I'm, I'm nuts, town meeting members, but. I mean, I think you could ask the same question of the legislature. And Meg, I feel like there's a political science term for the, there's sort of like two categories that I should know. It's like, there's two category ways of representing. There's like, will well, you help me? Um, so there's a representative democracy, which is what happens when people pick representatives to argue for them in a legislature. And then there is deliberative democracy when uh, the people themselves deliberate. And yes, there may not be, you know, I mean, generally a criticism of town meeting is there's in Putney, there's 1,700, maybe 1,800 voters registered. How many people actually come to town meeting? Well, if we're like 300, that would be pretty good. Uh, and the school that where we hold it, Central School, is not designed to hold. 1800 voters. So there's almost a, an expectation. Uh, so, but for, for me, the key piece is learning the habits of deliberation, which I see as really basic to being a citizen. And so uh, representative democracies do not do the same thing as deliberative democracies in terms of giving people uh, an opportunity, like a free public education in how to make decisions with others strangers, 
neighbors, people you have prejudices against because you've lived next to them for three generations and there was a feud back in the last century. So, you know, that's what deliberative democracy does. It shows how people are more complex than just how they are seen by one another. Representative democracy, I think sometimes reinforces the perception problem. People make claims, like I think that's what Olga was getting at. People can make claims of, oh, people in my district say this. Well, at town meeting, when you stand up, you can't say, well, I'm speaking from my street because other people in your street are there. And they're like, I don't feel the same way about buying a grader as you do at all. I think we should stay home when the road gets all washed out. Why, do, why does everybody have to leave all the time? So there's a, an element that, you know, where the, the deliberation itself prevents speaking for a group. You're forced to speak for yourself. And representative democracy keeps reinforcing, in my view, uh, and maybe I'm just getting old and ornery right now, uh, representation is a way of making claims that you actually don't have to prove. No, and it's really, I totally agree. And what I, sometimes I find my colleagues who are um, very, from a very different place, both politically and geographically than I am, are often very surprised where I'll, when I'll say like, oh yeah, one of my constituents, you know, said something similar to me or something like that. And they're like, you from down there in that place full of hippies and naked people and whatever else. I'm like, yes, in fact, I also have the full spectrum of humanity within the 4,000 people I represent. That in fact happens, the full spectrum of the humanity. Um, and I feel as a representative, since the, you know, I walked around and knocked on every single door in the district and I still feel like I actually have no idea what people want me to do. And I have no way of actually finding out what they want me to do. Right. Um, because I'm very aware that whoever shows up to tell me, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of people who don't have time and space and interest to do that. And so my theory is I'm going to make the decisions the best I can in terms of my theories of change about the universe for the mm -hmm. people that I sort of have some demographic information about. Mm -hmm. And they can decide if they think I'm doing a good job or not. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the best I can do. But that's trying to like represent people's opinions mm -hmm. is absolutely right. impossible. Right, right. Yeah. And so I don't pretend, um, but I think that, you know, the language that we have of representative democracy really calls us to pretend. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's it. That's exactly it. That's the myth. The mythos of representative democracy is that these are my constituents. I represent their interests. And uh, if they don't like me, they'll, they'll get me out of office. And, and I'm not against representative democracy, but it doesn't necessarily deal with our trust problem. So the trust mm -hmm. problem, that's the one where you have to have people in a room wrestling with this ideas real and being willing to say, and this is what's so beautiful, um, in, in some of the ways that uh, um, there's one organization I just, I've been involved with for a little while, Braver Angels. And uh, they come out of the 2015, 2016 awareness that, oh my God, it's like the country's going through a divorce. And it was a marriage counselor who started this thing using Lincoln's term, you know, to appeal to our better angels. Now it's braver angels because it takes that. even more courage. Uh, and, uh, and the understanding is that at a certain point, if the marriage is gonna work, and if we think about this as a democracy is gonna work, it's only when somebody says, well, you know, this is the way I feel about things, but these are the arguments on my side that I actually don't fully support. And even though I feel really strongly on the side, I think some of the arguments on that side are more persuasive. And that's when you start to like dissolve the culture wars, it's a great term because we really do have a war with one group with all these uh, affinities and claims against another group who all think the same way about everything, at least when they're with each other in their echo chambers. So how do you dissolve that? You get, you get the groups on either side to start to say, well, you know, I actually am not so impressed with this uh, argument for women's reproductive rights, even though on the whole I'm for it. But when people start talking this way, I'm not that happy. And that creates an opportunity for moving out of these two big blocks into different groups 
with different ideas. And then we maybe start to bump elbows with people who we didn't anticipate we could be best friends with on a cer certain issue. It is so courageous and vulnerable to name your cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And like to ask people to step into that together. That is so cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it is, I went to the last meeting for the Northern New England chapter. Uh, There's a lot of people in Vermont. I saw a lot of people who I didn't know had the same interest in like crossing over or listening or being aware of the fact that they didn't fully support everything on the left or whatever. Uh, so that I feel like this is uh, an opportunity for us going forward, very simple techniques, being vulnerable, and then you find out nobody shot you. I mean, for the most part, we don't get, we don't die from getting shot. We, we don't die from a lot of things we're so afraid is, are gonna happen. I think I'm most concerned about suicide rates than anything else, anything else. And maybe, you know, people might say, oh, well, maybe that's because you live in, on a, you know, this little farm in Putney and you white lady and, you know, some economic resources. I think that the suicide piece is, is what needs to, everybody should be saying like, wow, we don't even trust ourselves. Hmm. And, and own that. Like, that's a big grief for me. And anybody you talk to, like they lost a child. They lost a family member. They're afraid of what an uncle is going to do. I, I just feel that's hmm. across the uh, counties, across everything. So a lot of self-love has got to be part of this because we're our own worst enemy right now with these statistics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Meg. So bringing this back to town meeting, uh, you know, starting from that, that point of self-love and if town meetings and our municipalities and our systems are reflections of us and our, our priorities. Mm -hmm. um, how do we need to take care of them in this time of COVID mm -hmm. as we go forward? And while in some ways technology has increased access and maybe in some ways it has helped division, um, how, do we, how do we take care of our, ourselves as a community like this? Yeah, it's, I'm so stuck on that problem. I'm like really stuck. I, you know, I would love in order to sort of understand the stories of our community better and what, where people's cognitive dissonance is and where people's goals are and all of that. I would love for us to have so many more opportunities for these deeply deliberative conversations. And yet I don't, you know, have a staff or an office. Um, it's just me. There's no mechanism in Vermont's legislative process for us to have these, to support this kind of community conversation on the local level. Mm -hmm. We have this town meeting mechanism once a year. Mm -hmm. And I, so I don't, I don't know who owns the problem. Mm -hmm. And when we're in this situation where no one feels like they own the problem, well, we're stuck just like this. And so I, I want to know, I want to know what to do next because I desperately want us to be doing this work. And I think so many of us want us to be doing this work. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Any thoughts, Meg? Well, I mean, the, the, the good news is, is that it does seem like there's a lot more people realizing that if democracy is gonna keep going, it's gonna need to happen. Yes, our institutions need to be strong, but you know, the Senate should do a lot more deliberation, I think, and a lot more legislation. But for the most part, uh, the institutions held during a pretty rough period where there was very little trust in them uh, and the constitution held, but it's not getting at that, almost like the flesh. We can have a democracy and the skeletal system can be pretty good. You know, federalism is intact. Uh, uh, the COVID crisis shows us the upsides and the downsides of federalism. States did a, <laughs> some states did a great job, other states not so much. We got to see what worked, what didn't work. Uh, and then we also got to see how a national system may be useful. I don't know if it could ever really get through in the United States given our federalist past. 
But underneath all of that are this flesh. It's the flesh of the multitude is what Hart and Negri, political theorists, would talk about it. How do you take the flesh and make it so that it's uh, not uh, tearing itself apart? So I always go to, this is fairly recent, our common purpose put out by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And they have many, many suggestions on how to what do they say? Reinvent American democracy for the 21st century. And some of it is really specific, like um, for the Electoral College, increase the number of electors, have it be much more representational for states. Uh, that would also change the makeup of the House of Representatives. So some states like California that are screwed in terms of representation uh, that would balance it out. But the whole second third of it, the last third, is about setting up groups of people who are dealing with specific problems and, and using, now some of this is a lot of times it's volunteers or some yeah. private foundation. The thing is it doesn't cost a lot of money to create a space for people to talk to one another. It's actually fairly cheap as things go. And you could think of it as an infrastructure project on the discursive level, on the trust level. So, I agree, yeah. but I also think it takes something in order to sustain that energy. So, yeah. you know, point, four years ago, um, I started the Wyndham County Action Network with a bunch of people. And we had sort of a big beginning conversation. And then we started having these monthly cafes that which, you know, the goal of was to bring some of these really complex issues much closer to people's lives mm -hmm. and to have conversations about them. And it was really fun and exciting. And we added sort of enough sociality pieces of it to make it much more human to people. But, you know, the three of us that were doing it all wound up going in different directions with our life and it faded. And while I do think that things should, you know, ebb and flow based on interest and energy, yeah given the shape of the economy and the burden of care taking that people are under and all of these other things, I just, I think there needs to be a way of supporting people who are holding the bag so that they're willing to keep on holding the bag. Yeah. And definitely, you know, I can see some institutional support or legislative support on that sort. Uh, but one of the most successful grassroots movements is the 12 step program which really is just a framework. And once you have the format, you can get it. And uh, the Braver Angels or uh, National Issues Forum. So there's a number of groups that are out there, national groups, uh, that pretty much just train people in the format. And then people know what to expect. It's like you go to a 12-step meeting in Brattleboro, it's gonna be like a 12-step meeting in Memphis. Mm -hmm. uh, once you know how the ground rules go, uh, then it's like, okay, I wanna do that. It's like playing bridge except I'll be talking to people. So I, I think that, you know, this could actually take off now. Uh, I would guess that with precarious unemployment, there will need to be ways to pass money through into people's pockets that don't require jobs all the time. Uh, I don't know, I could imagine being on unemployment, perhaps because I know what that's like, and uh, giving my time to setting up debates and things of that sort. Because I think people are looking for meaning in their life. I do too. Yeah, I agree. And and these this is like low low cost. You don't need training. You don't need a degree. We really need to to get rid of this idea that a bachelor's degree is essential for being a, a capable person. Uh, it's just created debt. I, I don't know. If somebody used to be in this business, I just have nothing but shame and humiliation. I wish that uh, we had figured out other ways to get important knowledge out there without creating such a big debt. Meg, mm -hmm. I know. I, I, I hear you. And I want you to know that I am still going to be paying off my student loans when my son goes to college. And I actually don't have any regrets about that. So... I Thanks do. for the educating that you did in this incredibly expensive system because you did a good job of it. Mm -hmm. I want that to change. 
seriously. And I think- Oh yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. Me too. Like I was reading an article the other day about student, like about Biden administration priorities. And I got to the part about forgiving student loan debt. And I like really didn't read the rest of the article at all because I got lost in the wondrous tailspin of dreaming. And later I was talking to a colleague about- um, uh, some tax implications that were in that article. And I was like, oh, I never, I couldn't, I couldn't think, I couldn't, I couldn't big picture it because I was lost in my own experience of student loans. But yeah, no, it's, we do absolutely need to go beyond, um, beyond our assumptions about what a liberal arts degree provides and beyond our assumptions about what can be pr provided and available without a liberal arts degree. And it's interesting, the reach up, program, mm -hmm. which is, you know, our welfare program um, and parts of our food stamp program require that people engage in sort of useful activity in order to maintain their benefits, which has its own significant moral hazards mm -hmm. in it. But that's federal rules that are, which I doubt are changing anytime soon, um, came in under Clinton. Mm -hmm. And so that is an opportunity to think about what kinds of community service are offered. Because generally the community mm -hmm. service that those folks are required to do are, they're, it's essentially sort of underpaid work for a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. It's working the register at a nonprofit or something mm -hmm. like that, rather than engaging in acts of meaning making in your community. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, yeah. wouldn't that be great to get off of community service and say, okay, let's do civic engagement. I mean, why isn't that in all the correctional facilities? Like, this is a really important thing that you are able to make decisions with others about public matters. That's the whole thing about being a citizen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I feel like there's a lot of places where the, the state could say, oh, we're, we're making it happen anyway. Let's put civics which we understand on this really basic thing. Yeah, it's great if you read the Declaration of Independence. I'm all for it. It's an amazing document. I'm beginning to think it's a little too violent. I think I'd like to dial back the violence in the Declaration of Independence. But other than that, I think it's awesome. Uh, so, but that's, so that's part of civics, like the, these documents, like look at this constitution, it's tiny. And for people to know that, know the Declaration of Independence and know how to make decisions with others, good to go. Mm-hmm. So we have just about five minutes before the end of the show. What? I know. Um, good conversation. See, this is why we have them, because time flies. I want to make sure, Meg and Emily, that if there's anything you want to leave listeners with, that we do that before we, we sign off for the day. I just want to say that I desperately want to hear other people's thoughts on what a meaningful, deliberative community-driven process would look like in our town, in our state, in our country. And so of all of the topics that we talk about, this is the one, this is one of the ones that I just really would love to hear from people about. And I want other people having these conversations um, and sort of feeding back to us because this is, it's like, it's really the core of all of the other things we wrestle with. And Vermont's small enough that we can be having more of these conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Meg. Any thoughts you want to leave the audience with? Um, I guess I want to say that in the 21st century, for a person to think that uh, having thoughts about common matters is going to be fairly uh, counterintuitive. I, I think I the way the way I understand this movement of wanting to bring back deliberative democracy and getting people to wrestle with things with strangers uh, is that it's it's moving us backwards in some ways to a time in the country where uh, people understood themselves through their ability to speak in public. So lyceums, uh, it didn't used to be like Abraham Lincoln. He didn't go to liberal arts college. He was part participated in a lyceum and got to hear people who would stand up and wax eloquently for and against slavery. He was able to like really all the time be thinking about uh, what are these big questions. So I, I feel like there's something that happened uh, and you know, some people call it neoliberalism, global capitalism, all these ways in which we began to distrust ourselves. And uh, I tend to look at 
class and economic factors uh, and overproduction of elites is another term that's gotten used uh, frequently, that somehow we have to remind ourselves that we are capable just by being human beings, Emily talked about the full humanity. If we can like understand that part of our humanity is that we, we argue, we make suggestions, we disagree, we look for better conclusions and uh, that that's a lovely part of the mix of being a human being. So that would be my plug. Meg, thank you. Emily, do you have a toast for us before we sign off? I do, but even before I go to my toast, I would like to say that the views and opinions expressed here on the show, the Montpelier Happy Hour, are those of the host and the guests and not of any of the stations this might be broadcast on. Thank you. You're welcome. And so I will then toast to each of us having strength enough in our convictions to surface our own doubts. You're here. here. Yeah, Thank I you, see. Emily. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> you can find the Montpelier Happy Hour on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station every 2 p.m. on Friday. You can also find us online at the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page, as well as our Captivate uh, web page, and you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts if you so wish. Emily, if people have more questions, where can they reach you? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can find links to all of my various social media accounts, to my email address, to my phone number, as well as um, an opportunity to log into my weekly community conversations every Sunday at 11 a.m. And Meg, you have some events coming up at uh, in Newfane. Uh, can you share those quickly before we, we head yeah. on? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so March 17th, oops, let me make sure I have the right date. March 16th, that's a Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, Emily, sorry, I'm thinking of Emily who we just were on the Zoom call with. Uh, Erica Walsh and I of the Newfane more free library. Boy, this is so complicated. We're, we're beginning an, uh, a series of debates. And the first debate is, is town meeting obsolete? And we wow. will have people speaking on one side and then on the other side. Uh, it's a braver angel style debate. So the idea is to get out more ideas, more arguments. There will be no winners or losers, but it's really to give people a chance to weigh in on town meeting itself. So fun. Sounds fantastic. Meg Mott, thank you for joining us. Emily Kornheiser, thank you for joining us. Have a great week, everybody.